citizens. Thomas Luninger and Alexander Jadilek from Vienna are experts in this field of work, and they will introduce the current state of this topic. Both of them belong to Aka Forat, which is now got a new name, which we'll put in later, and it's um, basically focusing on privacy laws of citizens of the country. Thomas has already done many, many uh, presentations on this topic uh, in Belgium, also in the parliaments. Alexander is part of epicenter.org as a law lawyer, and the stage is yours. And welcome everyone to the translation. Uh, this translation is done by Nini and Starfish, and we welcome you. All right, a little bit of janitor topics. The working group on um, um, the, the shit. In 2017, we reached our highly set goals. Um, so we were thinking, what do we do now? Um, are we going to work on or are we just going to stop now? But there was this Mr. Snowden and this made us um, realize that we have to move on. We are working on many other topics in data retention now, including the state surveillance um, law, as well as net neutrality and other issues. And so uh, we started, we, we, we changed our name um, because we thought that um, data retention is not enough to tell what we're actually aiming for. The new work, Epicentrum Works, um, wants to show that it's like shock waves um, through all of society, um, the, the topics that affect us in this field. Um, we're going to work for um, basic and human rights in Austria. And we have a lot of stickers um, with the slogan, um, Civil Society Works because we think it's um, a recipe for success that if we work with um, support from the, the, the citizenship, um, citizenry, um, for example, when we work against uh, um, the secret service, um, but also with like uh, telecom organizations. Um, this talk is not only about epicenter, but also about net politics in Austria in general. Um, for example, there there have been many things going on there. Um, we now have um, an a regular event called Netzpolitische Abend, Net Political Evening, um, which is happening once a month in Vienna. Uh, we learned in Berlin how this works at the Netzpolitische Bier, and um, there found a group of people found itself. Um, to replicate the same thing in Vienna and we have always had a full house um, really every single time um, for very uh, different kinds of talks um, for example what um, the uh, unions are doing when it comes to um, consumer protection rates but also more court things. Um, we are like without any structure, we're just a discussion room, there is no statutes or organization behind. Um, just join if you ever happen to be there in Vienna for the right time. Um, at the same time, last year there was also the founding of the Chaos Computer Club Wien. Um, Yet another try of founding a Chaos Computer Club in, in Vienna. There was a Chaos Nahe Gruppe in Vienna. 
um, there, there have been a break, um, but now there's a new group like this. Um, the KS Computer Club in Austria has been active with um, consultation by the parliament, um, but also pulled off a very um, interesting event called Privacy Week. Um, Austria didn't have a bigger um, net politics event than one evening event, um, and this changed with the Privacy Week this year. Uh, we had stellar talks, and I really want to thank everyone who worked together for making this happen. We're looking forward that this works next year as well. And another thing that I definitely have to mention, Jugend Hakt, which uh, you from Germany probably know, it's the concept that you youngsters uh, teach how to program, how to code with mentoring systems. And I was at the first time where that happened in Austria. And now we have this going on in Austria with the same concept that you guys had in Germany. And I've heard nothing but good things are going on with that. And if you have any youngsters uh, around you that are interested in like send them there, it's a lot of fun. It's really good for them. All right, let's get to the hot facts now. The most important law this year was the Staatsschutzgesetz, the state safety law. We've been talking about the problematic aspect of this law in Austria for quite some time now. And because of a lot of privacy issues, this is something that we really need to pay attention to and not approve of. Over 30,000 people signed our petition to watch this law and not make it pass the way it's been constructed at the moment. We've done a lot of creative things to uh, work upon this topic. And I'm very thankful for everyone involved in working on this. The bigger picture is something very simple. Uh, at this, um, what we see here is the parliament building, and what we did was uh, we took balloons and put a security camera watching, uh, re rising high into the sea, like into the sky. And with this very small but very creative concept, we really made it big in the news because this is a very something that works visually very well. Unfortunately, politicians um, did not think about reconsidering the way that they're putting this law forward. So we worked on it again and did something different and portrayed on buildings of political importance related to this law uh, slogans that we are basically creating uh, new secret services. services. And we also portrayed Edward Snowden's uh, face on the buildings with projectors. And it was one of the very few snowy nights in uh, Austria. And it was very, very effective and it worked really well. But the law, unfortunately, got passed. What we're now seeing is the parliament uh, making the decision about the law that uh, they've been trying to prevent from passing in the way that it was formed because it highly interferes with personal privacy of Austrian citizens. I'm Amon Angerer, Antoni, Aslan, Aubauer, Auer, Bacher, Bayer, Becher, Belakovic, Jeneven, Belakovic, Bösch, Prost, Brückel, Brunner. We basically are watching with four perspectives into the parliament and they're trying to be part within the decision making process and want to try to show who is making what list, who's making what decision. 
Normally it takes five months to figure out who is making what decision, but this time around, within one week, we figured out who in which position of which party voted on this issue and this matter, and if they voted on their own conscience or what their facul like their, their faction of the party would want them to vote on. <coughs> The law is uh, publicized by now and it will be instated publicly uh, by July next, the past year. No, sorry, July 2016. For the second time in history, we filed a um, constitutional complaint. And in order to do so, we need one third of the parliament to support our claim. And we got basically what we happen, what happened was we got two parties to get involved in this. So we got to do a to file the constitutional complaint, and which is going to be dealt with in 2017. And uh, we hope that this will go our way. And now we're switching over to the second project, uh, second subject, uh, which is uh, the Bundestrojana, which is a uh, Trojan malware um, state-based. I would like to say a warm welcome to Werner Reiter, who unfortunately cannot be with us. So the Bundestrojana is what they named, uh, what in Germany is the state Trojana, which is straight Trojan horse, and it's something that we're fighting because we see it as a very problematic law. A little bit of short note on the history of the subject. We know about a leak that the text of the law was in the drawers of the ministry. But it was only brought forward in 2016 after the attacks in Brussels. And if we take into consideration how long it takes until something gets out of the drawer normally, it takes up to 83 days, but on this law it took nine days after the attacks of Brussels for that to be brought forward from the drawers of everything. It's a classical case of laws are being forward based on action that is taking place in other places where they're taking emotional, um, basically emotional reasoning to bring something forward and make something pass that normally maybe wouldn't pass. The ministry basically argued that, that the terrorists of Paris, through the network of PlayStation 4, communicated through that network. And this story was something that was basically fake news that was revealed in 2015 and in 2016 explained in the ministry as the reasoning for why this law is necessary. So basically, they're stating a case based on fake news. I don't really want to go into depth on the uh, law level of these kind of things. There's an unreasonable um, attack on privacy and data security that's happening through this snooping software, this surveillance software, which causes problems within. It starts with a question of who is programming this kind of software. And I mean, we can be sure that, that within the ministry, nobody is doing that. So you've got to hire companies that start doing that, phishing companies, hacking teams, who also cater to uh, totalitarian systems. You've got to buy on the black market. You've got to pay te put tax money into very, very fishy fields and industries. You have to target critical security issues when you're using this kind of software. 
quasi dazu erkoren worden, diese Software einzusetzen und gleichzeitig... So on the one hand, you have, you wanting to use this kind of software and then at the same time you also have the same ministry who is responsible to be protective in the same kind of field. And upon asking about this issue, uh, we only got evading answers. Another point that I want to raise is that searching a whole system. So if you want to look at all the data on one computer, so that, that's what they refer to as online searching, but it technically goes against the constitution of the state. So online surveillance of data and messaging data that is unencrypted is basically against the constitution of Austria, yet it's still going on with the laws that they already have. So there's a certain separation that the Austrian government is claiming exists, but within the text of the law, this separation does not exist. So they've been making exceptions, which... So, and all of this obviously remembers us of the thought police of George Orwell's 1984, computer systems, smartphones, our devices are super personal, highly personalized devices that know more than our actual partners that we share our lives with. There was a lot of a lot of critical voices uh, reviewing what was going on with this kind of law, and there's a lot of state um, institutions as well that also criticized these kind of um, passing of laws, these kind of working of how surveillance is already taking place, and we're really proud that we are one of the first few who entered their own suggestion of what should be changed, of how this should be addressed. We've talked to a lot of people and a lot of people have very, very critical thinking about this. There's a lot of private citizens also involved. This is the list. There's 56 official statements that were brought forward. And now I should want to show a short video. Does the state hack into our hand, uh, smartphone soon? Will they look after all of our steps? This should be made possible by a state law change officially to be more efficient in the fight against terrorism. Um, the state should be allowed to install software on smartphones and other devices um, of suspects um, without them knowing. Um, the Justice Ministry is therefore um, decorated today with a Trojan horse. It is um, symbolic for the so-called Bundestrojana, which is a software to, um, in order to surveil on people. Um, at least according to a possibly implemented law. Um, the activists from AK Vorrat Österreich are for the normal citizen, this would mean to be surveilled down to um, the underwear. Also, a, a professional person will know when they are hacked and will be able to surmount um, the surveillance tools. Um, 
um an die dortigen Informationen zu gelangen, und zwar bevor sie verschlüsselt werden. Agency ist... Dass der Staat eine Interessensumkehrung hat. Der Staat ist eigentlich dafür zuständig, uns vor Cyberattacken zu bewahren. The State has a State of Interest in this case. Um, the State will now be interested in um, surveilling and, and making sure that uh, surveillance works on their citizens, um, which also be, would be available to third people. Um, at the same time as their protest in front of the door, the Justice Minister is giving an interview. Um, in that way, apparently the law is not really useful, but we're going to work on it. This happens very rarely that the minister says, uh, well, maybe we haven't thought too much about our uh, law. Um, we're almost in tears because of so much um, honesty. We didn't come to tears. Um, for us, it was immediately recognizable that um, even though the Justice Minister was very insightful um, and this was a uh, this was a ministerial draft, um, but it didn't get moved over um, to the whole government, which would then be able to put it forward to the parliament, um, because they figured out that this would be uh, nonsensical. Um, the changes that were made, though, afterwards um, were um, not really detailed, um, most on an EU level, um, we're talking about anti-terrorism laws um, and security and anti-terrorism organizations should be able to use these kinds of tools, investigative tools um, for covered surveillance, including electronic surveillance. Um, we will stay alert. Um, but now we're going to talk more about net neutrality. Thank you, Alex. As said, this EU anti-terrorism um, directive is a directive, so it doesn't immediately get put into national law, but national parliaments have to um, form their own laws um, after this directive. Um, this means we can fight. Um, only in two cases we were able to stop the law um, with good arguments and a little bit of pressure from the street. Um, in this case, this worked um, with the long list of, of very many people that raised their arguments. And in this case, the politics listens to it. Um, it shows that democracy works, but also that um, an actor is necessary that points out these issues. We only are able to sh show um, the tip of the iceberg, but all of the administrative tasks and, and um, also the legal work um, is very necessary. If we move on to a European topic, uh, net neutrality, we had um, a great success in August after three years of campaigning um, the new rules for net neutrality for the internet in Europe are fixed. Um, in my other talk today with Chris from La Quadratude Net, uh, we have explained what inside this law. Um, here I'm going to show you only very quickly, um, because we in Austria were very uh, a key actor um, to make this law change possible. Um, Safety Internet EU was developed mainly in Austria um, and um, we had, for example, this demonstration with many, many groups um, that have 
not only in Vienna, but also in Riga, where the European um, Regulation Authority, BEREG, has its seat. Um, we came over and um, brought the first box of 100,000 comments. Um, there were total almost half a million contributions um, in six different EU languages. Um, in most of these um, consultation processes, there were only a couple of hundred mainly. Um, uh, contributions, but this time this was very different. Um, um, the official Zahl was ja früher immer 510.000. Das lag daran, dass einfach am Ende so viele E-Mails geschickt wurden, dass nicht mehr alle von dem E-Mail-Server, der ein Windows-Server war, uh, we, due to some technical um, issues, not all of the emails were, they were able to receive all of the emails. Um, last times, last, the last fight we won with faxes and also this time we had to um, revert to some old, old technology. Um, now we have some form of phrasing and now it, we're moving over to making sure that the, this is actually implemented. Um, just like with data security and e-privacy, uh, we're working on the... Uh, the practical uh, implications, especially there where providers are actually not following the new net neutrality regulations. For example, in Austria, uh, the mobile uh, provider 3 um, <laughs> was if you look on this graph, um, this is the, the Austrian Broadcasting Station's um, online service, and after you have used it for quite some time and um, have hit your limit, then um, it drops the, the traffic and you are unable to watch it. Um, but if you have used a provider that is part of the three mobile TV um, plan, then you are still allowed to use it even though you have... Um, used all of your data volume. This uh, is hurting um, the net neutrality principle. And so we fought against this and uh, put public pressure onto it and the uh, um, mobile provider changed their um, plans, which made, in some cases led to 1,700% more data volume for everyone. Um, the same principle, after the same principle, providers also worked in um, Slovenia and ne the Netherlands where um, net neutrality was implemented beforehand. We're going to work on all of these issues in the future. Um, if you ever see any violations of net neutrality, please turn to us for respectmynet.eu, uh, where you are able to um, add your new case. Um, if you see it on your own um, internet access, um, just put it there, and this is our crowd crowdsourced to-do list in the field. Also, if this is going well, we're looking for an economics person for our team, uh, because this is a part where you also have to make an argument from an economics standpoint of view. So moving on to the next topic, transparency law, which is something that seems to be a burning topic, a continuously burning topic in Austria, which Austria is one of the few countries that still has... Uh, it has a certain kind of law that makes you able to keep things very secretive and private, which is part of the Austrian constitution, which is rare within Europe countries. And what we're trying to work on is creating a transparent state, however, not a transparent citizen. We want to have a see-through democracy, but not uh, see-through citizens within this democracy. We have a group of people that do amazing work on this kind of field and they raise great awareness on this topic and we really want to thank them. Uh, you can see uh, one of the authors who's working on this issue portrayed on the slides right now. 
there is a draft that at this moment is being put forward, but it's not publicly accessible. So, in parts, what we already know is that is something that's going to make stuff worse than better. Everything that's considered in relation to um, how um, company practices, um, well, like basically how like companies get the actual job. That's something that's being impacted by the way that this law is being framed. And the question right now is, are we sticking to the 19th century uh, secret, secretive act, or are we creating a transparency law that will make the state more comprehensible for its citizens and democratic members? This law last December uh, was dealt with uh, in the constitutional uh, ministry, but it's still not part of the daily agenda of the parliament. We're sticking on this subject with the colleagues of a forum who's also working on this issue, and we're trying to continuously bring it forward. Uh, we're now talking about copyright laws. Günther Oettinger brought forward a copyright law that is disastrous. One of the aspects that's the most disastrous is called is Upload Filter, which forces any host of a website to check whatever, whatever they upload against copyright laws, which basically means that technically Google with Content AG, which any kind of knows about any kind of cultural stuff happening around the world and, and publicizing that, they can't really do that anymore because that's basically infringing copyright law in the understanding of how the EU is trying to put this forward with what Göttingen is trying to do. Thomas Troxell, the Minister for um, Media, is at least partially in favor of that. Um, but um, the most important part for him is how um, um, press support and media support um, will be handled in the future. Um, we would hope that this would be put on new feet and reinvented totally. Um, currently, it seems like Austria is um, producing its own problems and the uh, Boulevard Media um, by financing it. But, um, for example, fake news, it would be a good idea to um, find funding in the future to um, reducing fake news. The invite email to um, the justice uh, to the media ministry is um, consultation um, includes many many people. Um, there's many many laws um, that are being implemented at the same time, um, and the, the, most people don't have the energy to work on all, on all of them. Um, so it's very important to um, get knowledge about um, all of these things and, and like see what you're actually interested in. Um, in yellow, you see on the invite um, other ministries um, and state bodies. On the, uh, the, the green peop people on the list are um, the, the copyright industry, and in blue that's um, civil society and everyone else. Um, starting at yeah. So in green we have the people who are the actual rights holders, and in blue we have the industry itself. The law 
das Urheberrechtsgesetz, das uns Oettinger hier hinterlassen hat. The law that Oettinger zum, has inherited uh, us before he was um, moved over as, as commissioner um, for the budget of the EU. Whenever Günther Oettinger <laughs> does das something das stupid, das he will get, get, a, like, get, get promoted. Um, and um, this is one of the most problematic um, laws in the net politics field, um, including the upload filters for all platforms um, from Wikipedia to a Moodle e-learning platforms. Um, we are we we need to put this away. Um, this may not exist in Europe. Um, because you need the censoring infrastructure of China to actually put this in place, and then it can be used for other things as well. Um, we also um, work for a unified fair use. Um, it should be there should be some forms of limitation to copyright and they should be Bild von einem Politiker nehme und daraus irgendwie ein lustiges animated GIF mache, dann ist das ein Recht auf Including the modern forms, for example, if you make a GIF, um, this should be in a, in a fair loose use manner possible to do. Um, and the third thing we're working on is um, the um, ancillary right for the press publishers, um, which has already been in place in Spain and Germany, um, and which has massively failed there, and we shouldn't put it on an EU level. Next topic is heat, uh, which Alexander is going to take over. Um, for the last block, we're going to talk about the project HEAT, um, the handbook of evaluation of anti-terror legislation in Austria. Um, this is a work that we have worked on um, for the past year, um, and there was many, many contributors. Um, who has written it? We're gonna, I'm going to... The ACAFORAD, or now AP Center Works, um, has started all of this. And the Research Institute, um, the Center for Digital and Human Rights in Vienna, have worked together for this. It was financed by, by the IPA um, Stiftung. Um, by some random grant in Austria um, and with 25,000 euros of crowdfunding. Um, why did we do that? We are losing the war. We sometimes win a battle, but uh, and we also argument all of the uh, intricate legal stuff and, and we also move over to um, constitutional laws. But in the bigger picture, we're losing the war. Um, we want to have a fact-based security policy. We don't need um, ad hoc uh, knee-jerk legislation. And um, for that, we need transparency um, about how effective all of the uh, measures put in place actually are. So we looked at all of the laws. Um, the fact is that um, the need for a law um, has to be evaluated by the, um, the, the, the state already before putting the law in place. Um, this happens rarely in the field of surveillance. Um, we wanted our arguments that we put forward to the courts uh, already heard during um, the legislative project process. Um, we were in contact with um, a member of the government and he was like, well, why do we have to look into this already during the lawmaking process? The constitutional court will look into it anyways later on. Um, in this case, we were able to 
talk the ministry into um, b b talk, b thinking about these issues beforehand, but usually um, this doesn't happen. And he is supposed to be a total, total balance of surveillance. Um, this is a picture of the um, federal German um, constitutional court in Karlsruhe. Um, during uh, the, the data retention directive implementation in Germany, the constitutional court in Karlsruhe during the EU directive implementation um, case in Germany um, for data retention um, was introducing the word comprehensive uh, surveillance footnote uh, evaluation um, and so it, it exemplifies the need of the state to uh, think about um, the total um, sum of surveillance that hits a single person. Um, we have an interdisciplinary um, angle, and um, we're not only work, we're looking, working first of all from the law side, but also from the technology, uh, technological, and and from the humanities side. I just got the 20 minute warning, so I'm trying to keep in time. So we've taken this interdisciplinary attitude and angle on this, and we've been trying to work with everyone together. And I don't want to leave them out who've been involved in this project. On the left, Professor Kreisel from Vienna, Vienna Center for Society of Security, who's a social scientist and wrote the social scientist chapter of the of the charter. So basically the way that we address this, we started asking questions, started asking questions to the governments. In Austria it's possible to bring forward questions towards the parliament, which we uh, thankfully could do due to small parties within the oppositions. Uh, basically, which brought also for, like one of the things that was brought forward is that there was no Trojan software that was put to use within the Austrian uh, society through the government, uh, which was something that was never done through them. Yet, however, we have a leaked document from the uh, state police, which is from 2008, which clearly states the internet surveillance through key logging software, which was asked for, uh, which was brought forward to um, the state officials and the courts and so obviously the government had no idea what their actual policemen were doing or they just lie to us, we're not sure of this. So we looked at a few laws, which laws did we look at? There's obviously the police state securities uh, law, which is one of the most important ones, which was uh, instated this year, which is a law that enhances the possibility of surveillance and this is something that we up to this point have not had and now we're waiting on the constitutional courts whether or not this is actually something that they can pass and they can take into action. I would like to show you some graphics. This is one that we created. And what we've tried to do is mapping the 
dann farblich kodiert, welche Ermittlungsbefugnisse, welche Überwachungsbefugnisse sind vorgesehen. So basically what we've tried to do is bring forward offenses and we've like, tried to figure out what kind of ministry is getting involved in clearing these offenses and what is being used, what kind of surveillance is being put forward and what kind of offense do I need to have in order to get the kind of state surveillance that I want to have. Do I, for example, need a judge passing a law? Do I only need a state attorney getting involved? These kind of things. So we kind of made, kind of made clear if you have something like so damage of property, property damage, like what am I going to do with it? How do I get um, an actual surveillance um, warrant issued? If this is a terroristic act, all of a sudden this doesn't really matter anymore. It's not just a damage of property. It's obviously a terroristic act, which creates a completely different kind of uh justice scenario, which means that I don't even need a judge anymore to pass that kind of surveillance warrant. So what we want to show now is the, um, the weight of justification. You're all invited to download this document, take a closer look at it. It's, it is about the weight of justification. You have the criminal act. And the further I moved into the pre-field of the actual criminal act, there is a much, much bigger weight of justification the lawgiver not needs to give facts and give reasons of why these kind of laws need to already apply this kind of, like in this kind of early stages um, and the weight back like in those early stages is much much higher so this is about a uh, fair trial so this graphic shows the more people are affected by a directive, um, like data retention, for example, it means the whole public of Austria. But already within uh, Funkzellen um, Auswertung, where you basically extract the data of all the people whose phone numbers are within this kind of radar point. That already is a very big group of people, which obviously is not the whole public, but it is a large number of people. So what we did was we looked at the relevant uh, judiciary issues. And we also looked at how it was dealt with within Germany and within the European courts, because obviously those affect us and these are good exemplary cases. And we look at what kind of um, what kind of measures are available to uh, security officials and which are the ones that they actually use, like what kind of technologies. For example, the current law that they passed is obviously like, possible, like it's possible to extract geodata, geolocation data, uh, but it also goes as far as actually listening in. We've also tried to uh, go into sociological theory to really look at um, surveillance, um, a theory of surveillance and what it does within the society structure. And we know that with surveillance, conformity is something that is being enhanced highly. We also statistically want to uh, understand what kind of surveillance directives are being put forward, what, which ones are rejected. But we, I mean, we want to have an understanding of it, but obviously this is a difficult case because part of it is always a bit of a bit in the secretive 
field of this kind of lawmaking. But one of the central parts is the uh, catalog of criteria. What you see in really tiny letters is an overview of the kind of criteria that we've tried to work out. All of this is not completely new. We did not develop the wheel anew, but we've added a few things that we want to zoom into so that we can still have a few uh, areas, like time for questions. In Austria, based on Article 18, we have uh, the principle of legalizing. Norms need to be comprehensible. Norms cannot be against the Constitution. Only if the normal citizen of Austria can understand the norms and act upon these norms, the laws can be passed, and especially within the police state security law. This is something that needs to be highly questioned. So there's the formal aspect of it is not even fulfilled. Another aspect is the actual um, control of a judge. Is that something that that is given or not, so that's part of the legal protection when it comes to the kind of laws. It's obviously possible that evidence cannot be, proper, like, be put forward within a uh, case of justice and in the court of law, but at the same time, uh, it's a question of if you can still base your judging and ruling on that. Why are we doing this? For who are we doing this? And I mean, obviously, for the people who work within the ministries, but at the same time, it's also uh, for all the politicians, it's for all the civil civilians, it's for everyone who works within state security as well. And this uh, overview uh, will show you how it uh, affects our fundamental laws in Austria. This is a graph of how the Constitutional Court in Austria handles um, basic right um, infringements and if they are um, allowed or not. Um, we The next steps are making a printing version. We are very glad that um, Professor Joe Kanatacha from uh, the United Nations, he is um, the special envoy on uh, the private sphere um, has written um, the, the preamble to our text. Um, we will want more transparency and uh, we will act to make newer versions of this document as we move forward. Um, we would also like to do the same thing on an EU level. Um, and hope that our book is used um, both for um, jurisdictional analysis, but also um, in um, constitution uh, in, in court cases. Um, this we also want to work on some form of legal measure that is currently used um, to evaluate um, certain topics when it comes to the forming of law, including gender and um, and environmental issues, but not um, basic rights issues, and we want to like restructure all of that and and um, are supported with that um, from lawyers in the um, chancellery. So we now want to back it up and really kind of uh, understand of what is our understanding, what's our responsibilities. Our responsibility is a platform. We're a platform for protest, civil protest. 
uh, within relation to our constitutional basic fundamental laws. And if you ever want to get involved, if you think that you can do a better job than we do, our tools are all open source as well as our um, tool for uh, contributions. We believe that net politics and activism will only work if we have an actual community of shared community, of shared culture, of transparency and I mean, everyone is only cooking with water, you know, uh, and if you think that stuff looks a bit heavy headed or um, just overwhelming, it's an amazing feeling to be part of it. And in the most cases, we can make a very big difference on the topics that we work on. And there's so many that we need to work on. On the, I think that on the European base, up to this point, we've never had this many issues and um, laws that we're dealing with these kind of issues with net neutrality, um, copyright infringement, all of these things. There's so much happening. And we're expecting that next year within um, Austria, there's going to be something forward. A law proposal for uh, a copyright reform. If you want to participate, you want to take part, there is a... a Whatever you can do, you're a programmer, you're a graphic designer, you want to put your, your talent forward, there's so much that we need, and we have a small office, but without the volunteers, there's literally very little that we could do, nothing would be possible, no press release would be being put forward in public uh, without the volunteers that contribute, so th this is why I think it's so important that we make transparent how we work, so honestly, we live uh, of your donations, our only way to secure political independence is by financing ourselves through the donations from all of you, from uh, the private sector, and uh, we would be excited if you <laughs> would donate, obviously, and be a member of us. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and we're now moving uh, on towards the Q&A. Questions, please. Hi Tom, hi Alex. Amazing talk. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for your amazing work. Two comments that will then lead to a question. So you keep talking about the fight, the conflict-charged uh, situations with lawmakers. In a different talk, we heard about how the FBI globally hacks to take out child pornography rings. And I mean, there is the cases where the state needs to have these kind of methods and methodology. How can we have a consultative process where you can, on one hand, where you can have a collaborative process that where the lawmaker can make pass losses with you guys in kind of balanced ways with you guys. And the way that it works in England with the kind of white papers uh, where they can bring forward uh, draft for a law that actually takes all the different perspectives into account? That's a very good question. It's not the answer. All right, so we try to naturally create a constructive base for a discussion that includes all parties and all angles and all the aspects. And we're not only criticizing, of course, we really try to um, to, to when, when ministries are doing a great job, really also uh, talk about that. So, I mean, it, it, in order to create something that will work for everyone of the civil society, it's important to also point out when stuff is going well. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that is being discussed previously. But, I mean, we are also very hesitant to be part of these kind of cuddling parties. 
I mean, there's there's circles if you if you keep that kind of kernel policy, like you'll be privy to um, all basically all drafts of what kind of laws will be passed. But this is not what we think. We don't think this kind of discussion and basically lobbyism will create the kind of environment that we will want to work in. We don't think it's healthy to be owned by the politicians in this kind of perspective. We've had offers of entering ministry referendums based on the fact that afterwards we were n would not be allowed to speak about what was being discussed and what would be talked about. This is not how we think in a democratic society these kind of things should be discussed. So that's why we do make decisions on what kind of contact we will ha want to have and what we don't want to have. Now we're very sorry outside. Oh, we, we have one more time, like a little bit more time for one quick question. I'm interested how the um, Constitutional Court in, in, in Germany has uh, influence on Austrian things and how you can argument things in Austria then. Um, many things are, are quite common between Germany and Austria, but the Constitution is, uh, con the Constitution is not one of these fields. Um, for that you have to say that the Austrian highest court or Constitutional Court um, and, uh, and the German one are somehow friends. Um, they have um, some form of closeness um, in, in like constitutional history. And oftentimes we look to Germany and see um, how it goes in Germany. I, I trust in Karlsruhe, the German constitutional court. Um, it is some form of um, guardian of basic rights. Um, also in Luxembourg, the, the uh, European Court of Justice. <laughs> and at this point, they turn off the audio for us. <laughs> um, we will also.